The Book of Dede Korkut is said to be the building blocks of what makes modern Turks and the national epic of the August Turkic people. Even in recent years in Turkey, there's been a call to ban Santa Claus and instead invite Father Korkut during Christmas. I think most of the 150 million Turkic people know or heard of the tales. In this video, I'll tell you everything about the book, its history, the tales, and answer all the questions relating to these epic stories. I will also summarize all the 12 stories and then I'll analyze the book and its significance among the Turkic people and their identity. UNESCO, with the help of Azerbaijan government, celebrated the book in the year 2000. The book is called Kitabe Dede Korkut, or sometimes referred to as Ogoz Nameh, in a similar fashion to the Persian epic of Shah Nama, which I spoke in another video. It is a collection of 12 dastan, or stories, about heroic battles involving the Oghuz Turks, told by Dede Korkut, or Grandpa Korkut. The tales are mostly in prose, but contains verses too, which were sang along with an instrument by Dede Korkut. Who is Dede Korkut? He might have been a real person or a fictional character. In Central Asia, they refer to him as Korkut Atta or Father Korkut. Believed to have lived in 6th or 7th century CE, around the time of Prophet Muhammad. He was Ozon or a wise man, saint-like figure who told stories, sang songs, and played a string instrument, lute, called kopos, as he told these heroic tales for an audience. It's a kind of public theatrical performance. Apart from his storytelling, he also appeared at births, gave new babies names, at weddings to bless the couple, and at funerals. Even today, these tales are told by professional storytellers who play the instrument in the Turkic world. Now, there's a town named after him called Korkut in Kazakhstan. The August Turks see him as their forefather or a spiritual ancestor. In these tales, he always show up at the end when people are celebrating. He never fights. He comes to articulate the heroic adventures into a nice little story. Now who are the Oghuz Turks? Sometimes before they converted to Islam, the Turks called themselves Oghuz, meaning tribe. They were mostly steppe nomads in what is now Kazakhstan or close to the Altai Mountains. But when these Turkic tribes migrated southward and westward, then converted to Islam, they referred to themselves as Turkmen. The Book of Dede Korkut is about the Oghuz tribes as the Western Turkic people of modern Turkey, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and many other Turkic minorities in Iran, Syria, and Iraq. What was Oghuz Turk's life like? The Oghuz way of life was mainly nomadic, ship herding, horse riding, raiding enemy tribes, so life was pretty precarious and unpredictable. But as long as you were brave and showed courage, you had respect of everybody. Being strong in combat was the biggest virtue among men, as well as women. The Turks were able to rule a vast region and rule over a huge population of settled agricultural people, the Persians, the Arabs, the Afghans, and many more. What are these tales like? These heroic tales are in a way similar to Beowulf or the Persian epic of Shah Nama. They are mostly set in modern day northwestern Iran, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Georgia. But these places are somewhat superimposed on the original stories, which were set on the other side of the Caspian Sea in Central Asia, somewhere in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. At the time of these stories, the August Turks king is Bayander Khan, but he is mostly in the background. The main man is his son in law. Salur Kazan, who runs his affairs. Where do the tales take place? The main focus of the conflict is between the Muslim Turks of Azerbaijan against the Georgian or Byzantine Christians. I should point out that the main message of these tales is not religious or ethnic, but a more human one. They were meant to teach young Turks to be courageous, do the right things, and fulfill their duties. Scholars believe that the earlier version of this text existed in Central Asia, depicting the conflicts between different tribes of Oghuz people, or Turkic tribes. But later, they converted to Islam and moved westward towards the Caucasus and Anatolia, and the tales took an Islamic tone, and the conflict centered on Muslim Turks against Georgians and Greek Christians, or infidels as they are referred in the stories. But even Christians are given 
different Turkic names, suggesting that the tales were retold to fit the new places as they migrated westward. The evil king of Georgia is called Shokli, a Turkic name, and the central and the Central Asian river Emet runs in Anatolia. So the tales have two distinct periods. The older around 8th century CE in Central Asia, close to the river Oxus, and the second period is around 11th to 13th century CE, mostly in northern Iran, Azerbaijan, and Anatolia. When were these tales written down? We don't know the precise dates. Also, we don't know the author or the scribe who wrote them. They existed in oral form for centuries before. Some believe they were written a thousand years ago. In fact, the Azerbaijani government celebrated its 1000th anniversary in 2006 alongside UNESCO. Scholars believe the first written form must be around 1400s. As the language suggests, it was written in the Iranian Azerbaijan around that time, during the White Sheep Dynasty, who ruled northern Iran, Azerbaijan, Iran from 13th to 15th century. The White Sheep Dynasty claimed Bayander Khan, the king of the Oghuz in the Book of Dede Korkut, as their ancestor. The White Sheep rulers were Sunni Muslims, while the Black Sheep Dynasty, their rivals, were Shia Muslims, who also ruled most of Iran and Azerbaijan and Armenia around the same time. The current manuscript that exists today is from the 16th century during the Ottoman rule. The English translation was published in 1972. People suggest that the original musicality and rhythmic beauty is lost in translation. If you're Turkish or Oghuz and you have read in both English and the original Turkish, please leave a comment down below telling us if they are in fact different. Okay, now I will summarize all the 12 Dastan or tales. Please bear with me. Later I will tell you some of the themes and its significance in the Turkish ethnic identity, especially in the Turkish state building in early 20th century. Okay, so the first story is Bogaj Khan, son of Derse Khan. The Khan and his wife pray and do good deeds to have a son. They are rewarded with a son, Bogaj, which means bull. He grows into a formidable warrior who can wrestle anyone, even bulls and lions. But Derse Khan's other warriors grow very jealous of him. So they deceive the Khan one day. The Khan, thinking he's an enemy, shoots his own son from behind. But his wife finds the dead son and heals him with flowers and breast milk. Hearing that Bogaj is revived, the devious warriors worried they might be punished for their treachery, they kidnap the Khan. Bogaj confronts and defeats the 40 deceiving warriors and rescues his father. At the end, Bogaj is given his own country to rule, Bogajistan. I'm joking. Okay, number two, how Salur Kazan's house was pillaged. Salur Kazan is somewhat the main hero of the whole book. He's the son-in-law of the great Bayandir Khan. One day he gets drunk and goes hunting and leaving his house vulnerable. His enemy, King Shokli, uses the opportunity to rob his house and kidnap his family. Here we also meet a brave shepherd with a slingshot who stops Shokli taking the sheep too. For some reason, the sheep appear to be more important than the family. When Salur Kazan returns, he assembles an army in and kills King Shokli and rescues his family. Number three. Bamsi Berek of the Grey Horse. Two babies are engaged at birth, and when they grow up, they try to get married, but there are all sorts of obstacles. The boy is captured by enemy and kept for 16 years. When he hears that the girl is about to marry someone else, as everyone thinks he's long dead, he escapes with the help of enemy princess. He arrives at the wedding, and the girl recognizes him. Here, he reveals that he cannot marry her, as he has promised the infidel princess to marry instead. The girl is disappointed. He returns to rescue his warrior friends and marry the wrong woman. Number four. How Prince Uruz, the son of Prince Kazan, was taken prisoner. Salur Kazan, which we met in an earlier story, takes his own son hunting to teach him some skills, but they are ambushed. In the fight, his son is taken captive, but Salur Kazan thinks the boy has escaped and gone home. He returns home to find his wife furious at him for leaving the boy behind. He then returns to rescue his son, but soon joined by his wife and 40 female warriors. They defeat the enemy and rescue their son Uruz and hold a feast. The wife is pretty strong here as she confronts the useless husband and then instead of sulking, devise a practical plan to rescue the boy. Number five. 
Wild Dumrul, the son of Dukha Koja. This is a funny story. Wild Dumrul is like an old Spider-Man who fights bad guys. Whenever he hears someone has died, he wants to take revenge on the person who has killed them. But this time, someone has died of natural causes. Asking around, he learns that it was Azrael, the Islamic angel of death. Wild Dumrul is ready to kill the angel, but soon realizes the angel's power and the mighty God behind him. He realizes his mistake and begs for forgiveness. But God tells him if he can find someone else, God can and kill, he can live. Dumrul asks his parents. They refuse to sacrifice themselves. His wife volunteers. Dumrul refuses to take her offer because he loves her too much. He gives God an ultimatum. Either take both of their souls, his and his wife's, or keep them both alive. God takes his parents' souls instead, for they were selfish and not volunteering to save their son. Dumrul is given another 140 years to live. Oops, parents are sacrificed instead. Number 6. Khan Turali, son of Kanli Koja. This is a romantic tale. Khan Turali is very picky when it comes to choosing a wife. He wants a woman who is better than him in everything. Finally, he settles on the daughter of an infidel king of Trebzon. To marry Princess Saljan, he has to defeat a lion, a bull, and a camel. He passes the tests and gets the princess. The Christian king regrets his decision and decides to take her back. In the fight, Khan Turali is in trouble and almost on the verge of defeat but saved by his new wife. Now he feels humiliated. He asks her to shoot him out of his misery but she misses her shot and they realize that they really love each other. So what if he lost his pride? Saljan is a true hero who puts her husband to shame but they end up a happy couple. Not sure for how long. Number 7. Yeginek, son of Kazile Koja. Kazile Koja gets drunk and goes to raid a castle, as you would do when you're drunk. Of course, he's captured and put in a dungeon. His captor is the infidel king who has a half ton mace that nobody can get even close to him. Years go by and Kazile Koja's son grows up and rescues him from the infidel king. He introduces himself to his father who is overjoyed by the surprise. Number 8. How Basat Killed Tepegos. This tale is a favorite among Turkic kids from Kazakhstan to Azerbaijan and Turkey. It's about a lost boy who is raised by lions, but when he returns to Ugo's world, he has a strange habit. He drinks the blood out of people's horses. Dede Kurkut names him Basat, meaning attack horse, and teaches him to behave like human. Sometimes later, a shepherd impregnates a demon who gives birth to one-eyed monster. Basat's father takes the one-eyed monster at home as if he doesn't have enough of these weird kids at home. But he soon realizes that the monster instead of playing with other kids kills them one by one. When Basat hears this development he challenges the monster and kills him. The August Turks celebrate. This is somewhat similar to Homer's Odyssey and the Cyclops tale. Number 9. Emren, son of Begil. This is also a bit funny. Begil falls off his horse but is too embarrassed to tell anyone. He stays home while nursing his injury. His wife asks him repeatedly what happened but he finally tells his clumsy wife the truth and she leaks the news. Soon everyone knows. The news gets to the enemy king Shokli who thinks it's the perfect timing to attack. But Begil's son, despite being very young, defeats Shokli and converts him to Islam and the August Turks celebrate. Number 10. Segrek, son of Ushun Koja. This is a sleepy story. A boy sits on a mission to rescue his captive brother, but along the way he falls asleep. The enemy attacks, but he manages to defend himself and soon falls asleep again. Then there's another attack. He again manages to defend himself, then another sleep. Finally, the enemy king tells his captive brother, if you kill the sleepy warrior, I'll free you. The captive brother accepts the challenge to kill the sleepy boy, his own brother. But when he goes near him, he recognizes him as Ogus. They talk and find out that they are actually brothers. They team up and defeat the enemy and return home. Everyone rejoices, and both boys are wedded to beautiful brides. Number 11. How Salur Kazan was taken prisoner and his son Uruz freed him. Salur Kazan is tricked by a bird sent by Byzantine king. He is captured and kept captive. Years go by, his son grows up and attempts to rescue his father. But the crafty Byzantine king sends the father to fight the son's army. The son injures his father but then they recognize each other. Together they defeat the enemy and have a huge feast to celebrate. This is somewhat similar to Shahnama's story of Rostam and Sura. But the difference is that Rostam injures and kills his son and only then then he recognizes him, which is more tragic.
12. How the outer Oghuz rebelled against the inner Oghuz and how Beirek died. Once in a while, Salur Kazan allows Oghuz Turks to loot his own tent and take everything with them. It is like inviting your neighbors once a year to clean your house of all your possessions. There are two Oghuz tribes, one is inner and one is outer. On this particular year, Salur Kazan tells the inner Oghuz to loot his tent first and by the time the outer Oghuz arrive, the tent is almost empty. The outer Oghuz Oghuz are very outraged. They wage a war on Salar Kazan, but they are defeated and then there is a feast. 13. The Wisdom of Dede Korkut This part is a collection of wisdom and sayings attributed to Dede Korkut. It ends with a discussion about different types of wives. Okay, now let's talk about the themes of these stories. Some of the common themes that run through the book of Dede Korkut are loyalty, courage, self-sacrifice, respect, love between family members, and warning against those who don't follow these ideals. Fathers are generally pretty stupid. So on so many occasions they get in trouble because they either drink or they are too full of themselves. When men are in trouble, their wives and sons usually save the day. Something that struck me was how practical the people are. When they face danger or are in rage or very angry, those who use their common sense and act in a more practical way usually win and get the rewards. They try to channel their emotions toward a practical solution. At the end of every tale, Dede Korkut comes to summarize the events into a nice little story that teaches people how to avoid mistakes. In a sense, these are cautionary tales to teach the young Turkic kids how to react to a difficult situation or how to act in a proper way. Another thing that I found quite interesting was how adept the tales were in dealing with new situations in environment. Despite having a hierarchy among the Oghuz Turks, when someone brave enough or good enough to save the day, they are rewarded no matter who they are. The tales also emphasize forgiveness rather than retribution. In most cases, forgiveness is better than revenge. By reading the tales, you get the feeling that these people were constantly attacking one another or plundering and pillaging. It is similar to the pirate's tale of the rough seas where you have to rob others of their possessions and treasures. In fact, in one of the stories, Salur Kazan invites Ogus people to come and loot his tent every few years. It is like Boxing Day or Black Friday sales, but everything is free. So the kind of world the Ogus Turks lived were interesting as you were never safe from someone's hijacking your car, I mean emptying your tent while you walk your dog. I mean horse. It's like a sport. Another important thing is to have a son. Sons are quite useful when their fathers are captured or kidnapped, they usually come and rescue. But they have to wait until the son grows up, so it takes years. It's like having a driver and you can relax and enjoy your beer, ensure that your son will rescue you from some dungeon in the enemy territory or a pub. If you go hunting and accidentally step into your enemy's garden, your son will come and pick you up. On many occasions when men get drunk, they go plundering other people's tents. Something hasn't changed. Even today, if you visit big cities on Friday or Saturday night, millions of drunken men looking for a place to pillage. Women. One of the most striking aspects of Dede Korko tales is the role of women. Although women aren't the full-time warriors, they do engage in real combat and ride their horses to fight alongside men, and in some cases they are the decisive force. They have a very active role in society, they wrestle, and in some cases they are much stronger than men. Most of the stupid characters who get drunk are men. Despite their heroism, they are always loyal to their husband, but not submissive. They confront their husband when they mess things up. Women are highly respected in Dede Korkut. Women also appear more level-headed than men. Women can do pretty much anything men can do. To make it even more interesting, women don't raid other tribes or get drunk. In a sense, women are the more rational in Ogus society as depicted in Dede Korkut. Now let me talk about the influence of this book. In Turkey, Kitab Dede Korkut was published in 1916, just as Turkey was modernizing itself from the Ottoman rule. In fact, the young Turks used the epic of Dede Korkut to promote a unified Turkish identity and nationalism, which the Ottomans didn't. The Ottomans promoted a more Islamic identity instead. So when Mustafa Kemal Atatürk took over, they were trying to move away from their Islamic identity to a more Turkic identity with a more European modern outlook. The book of Dede Korkut 
Wade was used as a symbol of this drive and especially they highlighted how the book championed women, which was somewhat contrary to the Islamic role of women. The book also helped the Turks to connect with their pre-Islamic and pre-Arab identity. Ataturk wanted to create a modern secular Turkey. The interesting thing about the book is that while it was written in the 14th century, the tales are much older, perhaps 13th century or 8th century. They still feel quite nostalgic of their own past. So the people in these stories who lived a thousand or so years ago were lamenting and how things have changed for good, but in some situations things have changed for worse. So this looking back to the past glory is not a very new thing among anybody really. Even at the time of Dede Korkut, they had the same or similar nostalgic feeling about their ancestral past. A time when things were simpler, a time when everything was black and white and heroes were honest and, and villains were dishonest. Nostalgia is a very human thing. Okay, let me know what you think of these tales of Dede Korkut. I would love to hear from you, especially from the people of Turkic descent. Also, feel free to ask questions. If I can't answer, I'm sure somebody in the community can. If you enjoyed this this video please help me by sharing the video so more people get to know about these amazing tales. I really enjoyed Dede Korkut. Thank you.